Good afternoon and good morning to everyone from coast to coast and welcome to today's webinar, Prepping for the President, Planning Rutgers 250th Commencement. Uh, this will be an interview style session featuring Jim Cadamus, Senior Advisor for Sightlines, and Tony Calcato, Senior Vice President of Institutional Planning and Operations at Rutgers University. My name is Eric Nolan, I'm the Senior Marketing Manager at Sightlines and I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we have a big crowd for this webinar so we're really excited about that. Um, I'll be moderating today's session as, as Jim and Tony discuss the historic visit from the President at Rutgers University and the massive preparation effort for their 250th commencement ceremony. Uh, now before we get started, I'd just like to express how thrilled we are to have join, uh, Tony join us again for the, one of these webinars as our interviewee. Uh, Tony has been with Rutgers University for almost 25 years and was the chair of the commencement task force, so there's really no one better to talk to you about this experience and what it took to make it a success. Uh, Jim, who joined Sightlines over 10 years ago as our Vice President, after working more than 30 years in New York State and local government, has worked with Tony and Rutgers for many years and has presented with Tony on a number of occasions, uh, including a webinar that we hosted back in March about creating a new paradigm around the, state of, the fate of your facilities on campus. So we're really excited to have the opportunity to connect them both again today and we know that you all enjoy the, the engaging discussion between these two industry leaders. Uh, so a big thank you to both Jim and Tony. Uh, now let's quickly review today's agenda. First, Jim and Tony will discuss the background of Rutgers commencement planning and logistics, uh, really what it took to organize this event in the days leading up to it, days and weeks. Uh, and then we'll talk about the day, actual day of the event, everything from timeline to executing on the extensive plan that they had in place. Uh, Jim and Tony will then do a by the numbers review of just how many players were involved uh, from graduates to guests, staff, volunteers, and ultimately what it took to get them all there uh, on the day. Uh, we'll then do a quick recap of the impact that it had on Rutgers and finally devote plenty of time to any questions or comments submitted uh, throughout today's session. And with this in mind, I'd like to remind you that if you have any questions or comments during the presentation for either Jim or Tony, please don't hesitate to share those with us as you think of them. Uh, we'd like this to be an interactive session and we very much look forward to answering any questions that come up along the way. I'll be monitoring them throughout the presentation and we'll do our best to address each and every one of them towards the end of the presentation. Uh, to submit a question or a comment, simply enter into the questions box on your GoToWebinar window pane and they will be sent directly to us. Uh, to answer one question up front that we typically receive, following today's session, each of you will receive an email that contains links to both the presentation slides and webinar recording for your continued engagement with this material. Uh, we'll also, also be sure to include some complimentary content that we think you might find valuable, so uh, please keep an eye out for that email tomorrow. Uh, and with that, I'll wrap it up here and pass it off to Jim to get the conversation started. So take it away, Jim. Thank you uh, very much, Eric and Tony. Thank you for coming, joining us again um, to talk about this, this topic of the 2016 commencement. And uh, 250 years, that takes you back to uh, 1766, by my calculations, for the first graduation ceremony. So there's a long history here um, before the forming of the Constitution. So this is going to be a big day, no matter what, for your graduates and for your university. And then uh, it looks like a little short notice to find out that the President of the United States was going to join you. That's correct. So thank you, Jim, for having me again. Eric, it's always a pleasure. Um, yeah, this was, uh, so yes, Rutgers predates the United States of America, dating back to 1766. It's one of the original colonial colleges and only one of two, actually, that are not Ivy League, with the other one uh, being William & Mary in Virginia. So uh, we are proud of our history and our tradition. Um, our first graduating class amounted to exactly one person. And the procession was led, I'm told, anecdotally by the custodian at the school. So I think things have kind of come full circle in, in some respects. So we've had a year-long um, year uh, uh, celebration here for the 250th. We had invited the president uh, over two years ago, actually going into our third year, to, to join us. And um, truth be told, we had never really heard back uh, one way or another. And uh, we realize and recognize that there are so many schools that do invite the president um, to be the commencement uh, addressee. 
uh, on a regular basis every year. So he does accept uh, three invitations, typically a little bit of a larger school, a military academy that he addresses every year, and then typically something of a smaller school. And by a larger school, not so much um, schools as large as Rutgers. So we have 67,000 students. Um, we are spread across the state of New Jersey. We have campuses in Newark and in Camden. And uh, we are a medical uh, campus as well. So it's uh, a full uh, delivery of, um, of service here by way of education. And um, when we received the announcement that he was going to accept and come to Rutgers, um, it was on April 14th. Commencement was actually uh, May 30th. So I should tell you uh, a little bit um, about how that all came about. Uh, we were called into a meeting, uh, the president's senior leadership team, in the afternoon. And uh, he made the announcement that the White House had called and had decided to uh, come and, and and have uh, the president join us for commencement. It was a short notice, 30 days, typically. Um, if you look at some of the numbers there, Howard had 49 days. That was the other university this year. Um, you see Irvine, 60 days, almost two months, and Arizona, 80 days, which uh, in, in, this, in these terms is almost a lifetime, believe it or not. So commencement here at Rutgers is typically handled through the secretary's office. Uh, operations lend support, but everything is really done uh, at the secretary's office. They're the one that put it together. They're the ones that um, that uh, send out all the invitations. Um, they're the ones that have the control of the program, and then we are, of course, act in support. So we have one university commencement at our un at our stadium, and then many of the schools have um, uh, convocations. Um, either on that day or in the week surrounding university commencement. So we have approximately 12,000 graduates uh, university-wide. Um, and we normally get somewhere around 30,000 people, including the graduates, to university commencement. And it is uh, there's no ticketing. You request as many as you want, and uh, typically we it's not a problem. What we do is uh, is let you know, of course, you can bring as many guests as you like, and uh, we supply you with parking passes so that we can kind of control the flow of parking in and out of uh, university. And uh, so my action really has been limited at best um, with, the, with respect to commencement. It's not something I normally um, get involved with. So now the president's going to show up. It's a big event anyway um, for the families, of course, because of the commencement and a big event for the 250th uh, anniversary. Now you've got uh, an operations group. You're named the head of it. Um, so talk a little bit about uh, the plan and execution of uh, this whole event and what had to be pulled off and uh, what was kind of the, the planning cycle and who was involved. So. Um this happened on a Wednesday or a Thursday. On Monday, the president called me and said, um, you know, uh, here's the good news. Um, this is all yours. Make sure it happens and it goes off without a hitch. So um, in thinking about what the vehicle was that we would need to use, I thought that potentially the best way to do this was to use a vehicle we already had in place. And so we have an emergency operations command center that exists. We have an emergency operations team that stretches across the university. Typically, of course, these are activated only under circumstances of emergencies, right? If we have a hurricane, another Sandy, if um, there's some severe inclement weather coming, if uh, uh, some uh, threat on campus, and that's when we actually activate uh, this group of people. So um, the thinking was that what we would do is use this vehicle as a vehicle to plan and execute this commencement. So I think I want to uh, spend a few minutes here just um, talking a little bit about the need that we saw right away, and this was extremely important for me, was that while we had the President of the United States coming to attend commencement, 
commencement is still the culmination of many years of work and sacrifice, and it's a major milestone in our graduates' lives. And it's a major milestone in their lives, and it's a major milestone in their friends and those people that provided support along the way. And many of their family members had never set foot on our campus. Many, 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 probably better than 50% of our graduates are, are first generation, first ones to come to college in their school. So it was a celebration for them, and we needed to be sensitive and treat it that way. We needed to be careful that um, no one became starstruck because this was the president of the United States that was coming, and that was critical to us. That was critical that we put that uh, in perspective, and that first and foremost, this was a party for them. And uh, there was a time, a point in time, where I would actually um, refer to this as, as throwing a party for 50,000 people uh, while, while um, hosting the most important person in the world. And that's kind of the way we looked at it. First and foremost, we needed to make sure that, that, that they were tended to and that everything that, that we needed to do surrounded them, surrounded our graduates and their families. So with that, we established and reopened our emergency operations center in a modified version on uh, April 22nd, which was exactly 22 days before commencement. And what we established almost immediately was a, uh, a regular cadence of, uh, of meetings. So we would have meetings that were department and interdepartment, meetings with our governmental agencies, and uh, meetings with our functional and tactical teams. And all of these meetings would then kind of uh, look at what we were doing, what the risks were that we had, what the items were, uh, that needed to be com completed and what our critical decisions that needed to be made were, and then what the parked items was. So let me, let me talk a little bit about that. We would have at our emergency operations center, we put together a team, and uh, you'll see that on the next slide, of, um, of 10, 10 different teams, and they were all headed by, uh, by fairly high-level uh, individuals. And what this would be, um, we had our administration led by the university secretary, and this was basically all the ticketing in the academic side, logistics at the stadium itself, our emergency services, our safety and security, of course, to work hand in hand with all of the different, um, all of our different uh, agency partners, Secret Service, FBI, Joint Terrorism Task Force, uh, the military, all of them had representation. Our traffic logistics, remember we're moving 50,000, actually 52,000 people in a very short period of time, both coming in and going out. Facilities, heading up the logistics, our student affairs, um, volunteers, uh, manning outside areas because we could not get everyone into the stadium. Communications, of course, labor, and labor was critically important to us because we recognized that all of a sudden, um, with 26 unions that we have at Rutgers, we needed to be very careful that we were not stepping on any toes and that everything was assigned as it should be, and of course, our OIT. So if you were to go back a second, Eric, if you don't mind, to slide seven, what we would have is each one of those individuals step up and they would do a report out on their area. And when they report out, it's what had been done from the previous meeting. And we read, we met pretty much on a three to four day cycle, uh, a little bit more almost on an everyday cycle uh, towards the end. What they still needed to do, what items were no longer important because some things just fall by the wayside as other things pick up speed. And then lastly, where my help was needed to get something to move. And then we looked out at our critical path view. What is it, what milestones do we need to hit in order to make sure that we could make this a success? And by doing that, what we had and what we did for those 22 days, each team came up with a schedule of what they needed to get done by any one of those days. And what um, that day came, that task had to be completed. And if it fell by the wayside, we had to then go back in and determine why and how do we get it back on and what else it was impacting. And then lastly, uh, we had a 48-hour view. And what that really meant was from 6 a.m. Saturday to 
to 6 p.m. Sunday. Every team had an hour-by-hour hour schedule of what it was, so a matrix, both of these were matrices, of what it was that needed to be accomplished by that hour to continue to make this a success. So a remarkable planning process and a very, very complex one, lots of moving parts. I know our audience don't even be particularly interested in the role facilities played in here because, um, you know, just the extent to which um, you, they assisted in the um, whole event, but also how did they do their work when you and many of the other folks were attending to this big event? Um, how did the ongoing day-to-day -day operations of the maintenance and, and, and cleaning of facilities happen as a result of, uh, you know, the, 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 essentially did this get in the way? So <laughs> the so, variety so, I think is very Right. So there was, there has always been, and, uh, you know, this time of the year, these are the, the activities that we are engaged in, whether they're the convocations or the commencement itself. Of course, there was an incremental piece to this. Um, so those, uh, the adjustments in labor actually have gone on over the course of the year, knowing that we had to make more labor available when we got to this point of the year. And that would have happened whether we had the president here or we did not. But um, there is an uptick. There are more things that need to happen. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we would never have put up 8,000 <coughs> bike racks as um, barriers. And of course, that took extra labor in order to do that. We also have to remember that a lot of the labor that we use, uh, because a lot of these are vendors that we bring in, is their labor. So um, that helped the situation somewhat as well. And um, we are uh, working on these convocations for probably our grounds department spends an inordinate amount of time in May doing all of the setups um, and breakdowns. And then, of course, the people that work at the stadium regularly are still assigned to the stadium, so this is what they're doing for the course of those few weeks. And um, that kind of happens throughout, whether we're talking about labor or we're talking about traffic and logistics or labor itself. Um, you know, we have a number of volunteers, and I'll tell you one of the things we need to be very careful with, and this was something that came up, is that uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, doesn't permit an individual to perform hours of volunteer service for a public agency that they would normally do. So we could not have, for instance, a mechanic volunteering his services and maybe uh, you know dealing with issues in a bathroom because that's his normal job. If the mechanic was volunteering his services and acting as a marshal on the field, that's fine. We can take the volunteer. So we did have a mix. We just needed to be very careful as to how we set that up and what we did. Very, very interesting. I think that you know the point that really strikes me, Tony, is the the fact that you were going to have a big event here anyway, whether it was right. just the graduation on any graduation or the 250th anniversary. Uh, the president really became an incremental to an incremental adjustment, if you will. And I want to yeah. ask a little bit later about that and what the incremental costs and factors were in this. But, you know, I think it's important for the audience to realize that, you know, you're going to have a big event anyway. This just was an, an add-on to it, obviously one that took a lot of time, detail, and attention, but important, too, for everybody to kind of understand that this was sort of a core mission activity anyway for you guys. That's correct. That's correct. We, we engage in this and we do big events. We've done the Dalai Lama, so we've done big events, but this was, of course, never one of this magnitude or, or what is associated with this by way of security and needs uh, that the President of the United States brings. So, so let's talk a little bit about that whole security and that advanced planning. Six days prior to the event on the May 9th, you had your advanced teams, and so um, we'd like to hear a little bit about yep. Um, how you dealt with the White House and the Secret Service and the military as part of this whole event. So interestingly, um, our first meeting, first meeting, boots on the ground meeting with anyone associated with the presidential visit was six days out on the Monday before the Sunday commencement. This is a standard operating procedure, apparently. Um, we had a very brief meeting um, early on that lasted about 
20 minutes uh, with respect to uh, what would be happening. But this was our first meeting. So the first thing we actually did, um, and I was a part of this, was meeting with the Marine, the one, the, actually, the actual Marine One pilots who uh, came to campus and scouted out a number of locations to determine what would be the best landing zone for Marine One, where the President would come into. Then later that day, we met with the White House advance team and uh, the military advance team, as well as the United States Secret Service. Um, on our end, I brought with us that team that you saw of the 10 different individuals that were heading up the different areas. And uh, we sat in a room and went around what the expectations were on the side of the White House, what the expectations were by way of the military, what the expectations were by the way of the United States Secret Service. And that was the kickoff. That was at midday, essentially, on uh, that Monday. And from there, it was a series of never-ending um, uh, meetings that required many adjustments as we went through the week. And uh, many areas uh, where you know, we needed to figure out uh, alternatives and what would be best. And of course now we're also partnering with, with all of the neighboring and surrounding municipalities and the state of New Jersey because we're going to need to close down, for instance, the highway and highway overpasses. Um, nobody gets the high ground, so to speak. Uh, we have to figure out exactly how the uh, transportation from the landing zone to the stadium would work. Um, so you've got these big items, and then you've got these smaller items, the minutia of a uh, holding room, for instance, for the president, uh, in between him having some meetings and meet and greets, and uh, getting ready, uh, actually and having lunch, a place for him to eat. And that needs to be set up. Um, so all of these items that uh, one would never think of, because you almost do these by rote, uh, take a little bit more uh, thought and actually um, require that they be addressed, right? So if you don't eat lunch, you don't eat lunch. Well, that's the President of the United States. He's going to eat lunch. And you need to set someplace up so he can eat lunch. So it's an it's so, a interesting but, process. Yeah, really interesting to think about the, 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 little, the little pieces here that may be part of a bigger picture. Tony, obviously one of the first things you think about in this day and age, unfortunately, is the security issues. Um, you're going to have security no matter what in an event like this because of the large number of people, the stadium, you know, whether it was a football game or a commencement. Um, to the extent to which you can talk about this, and I know we've talked about this before, I know you can't tell everything, but can you give our audience some insight about what are some of the security preparations that are required when you've got a president or, you know, I'm sure a presidential candidate coming to, to, the, uh, to a stadium uh, in your campus? Well, so of course, Secret Service, the United States Secret Service takes control of, of security, but they rely, I will tell you, heavily on their partner agencies throughout the state. So um, right from Rutgers University Police Department through the New Jersey State Police, and again, areas like New Jersey Joint Terrorism Task Force or uh, the FBI, almost anybody you could think of, Homeland Security, for instance, any uniformed personnel you could think of. So what happens is that they bring in um, approximately, for our in our case, uh, 50 magnetometers that were brought in, and the personnel to man those magnetometers, which are all uniformed division personnel. There's a perimeter of um, a certain perimeter in size around the stadium uh, that there's no cars that could be parked or even approach those types of things. We early on uh, determined that we would have a no bag policy at all. And what we had to do, again, these are the small things, because we had a no-bag policy. And remember, I mean, this is grandma coming in many cases, um, and grandpa, and, and you know, that's not something they're paying a lot of attention to. We actually uh, brought in trailers of lockers, company that did this for us. So they would be at a certain distance from the magnetometers. You could lock up your bag if you forgot to leave it in your car. We also had an enormous amount of volunteers in the parking lots and at the bus stops asking people to take bags back to their car because we didn't want them to get to the magnetometer and, and hold up the line. One of the reasons that we did that was that we needed to keep people moving. And so 50 magnetometers, they process about 350 people per magnetometer 
per hour, um, and we needed to keep that flowing. We could not, we could not under any circumstances, um, get a hiccup in there. And if they have to go through every bag, it becomes a problem. So those types of things that surround security. We also had to come up with an operational plan. This came up at the last hour, and it's not so much an operational plan. Um, that says, you know, we're going to do A, B, and C. It's an operational plan uh, that, that says, what do we have here? So I'll give you an example. Within that operational plan, um, we had 30,000 bottles of water for the graduates uh, on the field. And uh, one of the things that we, uh, then these were those regular, you know, uh, I guess 20-ounce uh, bottles of water or 15-ounce, whatever they are that you would normally buy in a store. Right. So right. had to end up what they were, the size, a picture of what they looked like. Then we had to go out and buy 30,000 cups because we weren't actually allowed to hand them out. We had to open them ourselves, pour it in the cup, and give it to the individuals. So wow. uh, you can imagine yeah. that's something you don't plan for. That's something that right. is uh, you, you, you don't normally do. They just hand out bottles of water. But because there is a danger or a perceived danger by the president's security team, that's uh, you need to address that type of thing. Yeah, we had so let's go right into that forest. But VIPs that we had to have dogs and uh, and the and the security teams do sweeps up because it was a little too close to the stadium. So right, those are the types of things. Let's go right to the day of the uh, the timeline of the day because you know that's I think our our, our audience could be real interested and there's some great pictures here about the number of people coming in and going through the security measures, et cetera. But here we are um, starting 8 a.m. The door is open. So why don't you walk us right. through this day? We had a and so I'll even give you one a little bit more than that. So at 10 p.m. the night before we turned the stadium over, it went on lockdown. And we turned our stadium and the area surrounding it over to the Secret Service. We provided four individuals that worked with their teams to let them into areas that normally would that um, would then be re-secured, but the locked areas, you know, whatever equipment rooms, whatever they may be. From 10 p.m. until uh, 5 a.m. the following morning, the Secret Service did a complete and total sweep of the entire complex. And uh, I can tell you, um, when I say complete, it was a complete sweep in areas that you would not even imagine that they went into. Um, then it is a complete lockdown. No one moves. There's post. Uh, by way of the Secret Service, Uniformed Personnel Division and Ununiformed Personnel Division. And they watch out over those areas that have already been cleaned. Um, at 6.30 a.m., we marshaled all of our people in one area. All of our people for a soft opening were brought through the magnetometers. There were two magnetometers that were open. They also needed to go through security. Once they were in, they could not leave again. You could only come in once. At 8 a.m., we opened the doors to the public. By 9 a.m., we had congestion at all gates, and we actually went out because, of course, um, we had graduate for graduates who forgot their tickets. So we had tickets printed up that we were holding, and we had volunteers, once they could prove to us they were a graduate, not just in a cap and gown, that they, we would give them a ticket so they could get onto the field. Again, security graduates would not get on the field without their ticket. Um, and, if, and so even if you had a cap and gown, you weren't getting there. We had an issue with uh, Newark and uh, Camden students. We offered them a ticket to come. This is not their commencement per se. They have their own. But because it was such a monumental event, and one of the few, first time ever we've had a sitting president, uh, what I did was arrange for actual trains uh, to depart from Newark and to depart from Camden so that we would get uh, literally um, no additional cars from those areas coming onto campus. So 9.04, we had the North train leave. Um, by 9.30 a.m., every magnetometer, all 50, were um, working at full capacity. So by this time, we had uh, complete and utter gridlock and congestion trying to arrive on campus. Our parking lots were filling quickly. And so what else? And we had what? I'll refer to as controlled chaos. We, that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted by 10 a.m. to have a total mess on our hands by way of traffic. 
because then we knew we could clear it. By 11.15, because then we knew we had people here. By 11.15, our um, campus road was completely clear, and you can see there's a picture there, actually, of traffic. This is the main entrance. Everyone was in the parking lot. At uh, 11.50 a.m., the we had a flyover. Uh, the president was on his way to our landing zone, and uh, he was close. 12.10, by 12, I should say, or, or actually about 11.45, everyone that wanted to be in the stadium was in the stadium, and we were at capacity with 52,000 people that day. At 12.10, the president arrived, and at 2.15 p.m., he departed. And I can tell you that that was a tremendous sigh of relief when he departed. Um, safe, mm -hmm. and that was critically important. So, Tony, you know, from the pictures, it looks like a pretty nice day, but I think there were some quirks in the way the day unfolded because everybody would be worried about the weather. And so how did you prepare in case, one, it was going to rain? And, and I think there's so another had, piece here that you want to talk about. Right. So we had a rain or shine, and uh, we had over 10,000 uh, clear ponchos ready to go for our graduates, not for our guests, but for our graduates. And it was a rain or shine event. Um, we, our experience has always been for commencement that we wind up with this 85 degree brutally hot day. The stadium is really very hot. Of course, the, the, the day is, is, is covered, but it's a very hot, uh, it, typically, and sun beating down. It's early May. It's kind of those first days of really that warm, warm, warm weather. And lo and behold, um, we had the exact opposite. So we had a day of high winds. Um, that never got out of the 60s, that was actually extremely chilly. So we wound up with about 28,000 of those 30,000 bottles of water left over. Um, and it created an enormous concern for me. So I knew that there were only two ways that the president, well, I should say I thought there were only two ways that this event would not go off with the, pre with the president. One would be, of course, a national emergency of some type. Um, and the second would be, God forbid, if something were to happen to the president himself. So um, those would be the two main ways that this would not happen. What I never expected was that high winds had the potential to shut us down because of the uh, way that the stage is set up. So the stage is not built for 40 mile per hour winds. I never, ever expected that would be the case. And if you look at that top right picture, you'll see that flag flying. And there were some scary moments because if we hit those types of gusts, actually at 35 miles per hour, we'd have to evacuate not just the stage, but the stadium itself. And I can tell you that this actually kept me up because the first time I heard about this was on Friday night. And that's when the front was starting to come through. So a little bit of luck, um, but it was a cold day. Mm -hmm. Great. That Very interesting. I think fascinating. Fascinating. So um, talk about the, the, the numbers. These numbers are astounding in terms of graduates and guests. And compare this also to what it would be, what it would have been normally had the president not come. Right. So, if the pre so we had 10,475 graduates on the field. Typically, we never put more than probably about 7,000 on the field. Um, that's usually what we would get, six to 7,000. And we had over 42,000 guests. We've never had really more than about 25,000. So our typical day here would be 30 to 35 all in versus 52,000. We would not ticket them, so no one's checking tickets. You'd be able to just come in uh, you know, and, and make your way. Um, so those numbers, you know, that's just not numbers we use, the numbers we're accustomed to. And remember, um, and you can see, I think, on that lower left-hand picture, the whole south end of that stadium behind the stage had to be shut down. So this right. was actually assigned seating that we had for security reasons, because the president is on that stage. And of course, you could not see. But for security reasons, that stage, that, that whole south end, we lost about 8,000 seats back there that we couldn't use. Um, we had so does that mean that some people did not get an entry that some people had to watch from remote locations? Well, yes. And so what we had done was we set up over 8,000 seats in a number of lo remote locations across our campuses, typically uh, 
are better. Well, of course, to begin with, we had some tents with AV uh, equipment in case it was a nice day and people wanted to remain outside. We also used um, many of our better, newer lecture halls because it had good equipment, good IT, um, and we were able to simulcast uh, through there, and those were very comfortable, air conditioned, of course, and, and, and all of the amenities you needed. And our uh, student centers were all set up. So we set up, I think it was uh, somewhere around, um, somewhere around uh, 8,000 additional seats, just in case. Uh, and we did not need all of them. We wound up using, though, uh, probably about 3,300 uh, of the 8,000. But, you know, this is one of those instances, if it was, a, I think, a nicer day, um, we may have had more people doing that. Yeah. So we had a little bit more by the numbers in terms of just the, the, the traffic and the management of the traffic and, and also, you know, from a security standpoint, talk about how so that we all had, uh, We had about 14,000 vehicles on campus, um, all approaching at the same time and more importantly, all leaving at the same time. So uh, that took us, uh, that took us uh, you know, some maneuvering and doing, but we had a great team working the logistics of that. We were running 106 buses all at the same time um, throughout the campus from the train stations picking people up, and we had those two dedicated trains um, that made their way in uh, as well. So um, it, it, the numbers here were, were just huge numbers, staggering type of numbers. I think our, our folks also would be interested in, were there incidents, were there people sick? I mean, obviously, when you put that many people in one place, you're going to have issues. Um, but uh, was there any kind of security issues or illnesses that, you know, had to be addressed? And how were you prepared had, for that? We had help from across the state, mutual aid, um, 133 different EML pers EMS personnel with 38 pieces of apparatus. We had minimal, minimal um, issues. We had eight transports, and, and none of these were serious in any way, shape, or form. Um, we had an extremely safe day with no one being sick uh, and uh, to the degree where they needed any kind of extended medical uh, treatment. And we had no arrests whatsoever um, at all. And we actually had no protesters, believe it or not. Even though we were prepared and we had set up an area for that, um, it turned out that we did not need it. So let's talk about the impact of all this because this is a, just a remarkable day and just a huge, huge event. Um, talk about the benefit to the campus, the, the university, the number of stories that you know that came out, and uh, just you know how it was received by the trustees, the president, and the administration, and the students. Right. So it became uh, it became a major story here, of course, in, in, in this area, the whole area, this, this northeast area, I'd venture to say. But I can tell you that uh, we had uh, over 12,000 stories. And remember, this is, uh, this is actually within a week of commencement. So this is somewhere, uh, these numbers are somewhere from the 20, maybe 5th of, of May. Um, and you can see the breakdown. This is the kind of press you just cannot buy. It was a a, and the kind of branding that it, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. He, you know, whether you agree or disagree with his policies, pretty much not important. He's still the President of the United States. It was a very engaging speech. Um, he, uh, it lifted, I think, in many ways the stature of, of Rutgers, and this is something, again, you, you just can't go out and make happen. This is, uh, happens because you get the most important person in the United States, of the world, actually here. Um, secondly, we had a great event. No one was hurt. No one was, there was nothing happened that was bad, and that was critically important. And you can see some of these numbers, you know, 236 million media impressions. That, that's everything included, where it popped up somewhere in the world um, that Obama was at Rutgers, that the President of the United States was at Rutgers, 236 million. And there are still stories that are happening to this day, and, and this is now, you know, for all intents and purposes, an old story. I'll tell you something else that came out of this, a lesson learned that to me was um, uh, just a, a, a tremendous perk um, with talent assessment. You know, you're working with so many different people and across so many different departments and areas and divisions, and, and um, 
you you really could see those individuals that rise to the occasion, those individuals that take uh, ownership, those individuals that bring um, so much more to the table. And it's interesting to see that because what's come out of this exercise for me is almost an identification of individuals um, that you could see could, could move all of operations forward. And so uh, that was an added perk. That was something I, I did not expect would come out of this. Yeah, it's kind of an unexpected benefit, and uh, that's an interesting point. Sorry, I think people would be interested in, and I'm interested in, what the incremental cost was to the university of this. Uh, was there as many ability to calculate, you know, just obviously it's going to be a big event. You were going to incur costs no matter what, but, you know, the security and some of the, 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 the um, all the other factors that were involved here um, give us some sense as to what the incremental costs were to do this work. So interestingly, uh, many of the costs, um, so costs that uh, are associated with requests by the White House or the United States Secret Service are actually funded by them. So uh, right. things like putting tents over magnetometers, if that's what they've asked for, they pay for that. Uh, you know, we, we engage it, we procure it, and then we bill them back. So there is an incremental cost. Uh, it, regardless, there's an incremental cost. I think that we're probably looking at something in the neighborhood of about a, a 10 uh, to 15 percent incremental cost on top of what we would normally do. So if our commencement normally runs in the neighborhood of uh, about on uh, 1.6 million, a little over that. Um, this is probably in the neighborhood of about 1.8, 1.9 million. So uh, yeah. there is some incremental cost. But uh, obviously the benefits uh, for the, from the standpoint of the attention, the media attention, the recognition, yeah. as you said, the branding of a university that's been working very hard, um, you know, recently joined the Big Ten and been really working very hard to become a well-known national university. I think this is a really great day yeah. and uh, Again, you ability not, to, for you guys to pull something stuff. Yeah, so that you could not buy this type of communications and these types of branding, this type of advertisement for that type of money. You just could, you'd spend millions and millions and millions and millions. And, um, and it's always a positive story. Again, it's not really about the president and who the president is and the politics of the president. It's about the president. It's the president of the United States. So, uh, and that's where, you know, where we, what we look at it or, or we, where we look at it from, the angle we use. So um, the million dollar question that uh, I think most people would want to know is, did you get a chance to meet the president? I did. I got a chance to meet the president, and I got a chance to speak to him for a little bit. Um, and uh, he was very engaging, and it was the thrill of a lifetime. Um, I had spent for the last week here from that Monday, I'd actually moved into a hotel room down here, and we were working 16 and 17 hour days every day until Saturday night. Um, I left here 6 p.m. Saturday and, and only returned for commencement the next day in the morning. Um, it was really operationally in all the right hands. Um, and I did get to meet him, and it was a thrill to meet him. And, and um, I would, uh, and I actually got a pair of presidential cufflinks as well. <laughs> so, so next time we see you with a suit and tie, which is not very often anyway, um, you'll have those cufflinks <laughs> up, right? <laughs> I will, I promise. <laughs> So, Eric, uh, let me turn it back to you and see if there's any questions that uh, that we've gotten from the audience. Uh, I think Tony's told a great story here on a really complex event and the kind of complicated and, and intricate planning that he had to do. And I think, you know, my observation is not only there was a, a, a plan well, well planned and well executed, but also, um, you know, the contingencies were really remarkable to think about, you know, the president having to have a place for lunch and, you know, the windy day and all those things that just came up that you just can't plan for, but you, even if you try to, uh, you got to be kind of fast on your feet. So, uh, Eric, any questions from the audience? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Tony. Um, we only got a couple. So you definitely did tell a very complete story. Uh, I think you've probably covered about everything. It's, you know, we've only had a few, I think, because of that. Uh, Jim, thank you actually for asking that cost question. That was one of those. Uh, that we got. 
Um, so I'm hoping that we're able to address that just naturally that way. Uh, another one that we got was, you know, although it was a uh, kind of a once in a lifetime unique event, uh, does Rutgers, do you guys launch any kind of post-event surveys? Do you try to gather feedback from attendees, specifically the students, on these annual events to see, you know, to kind of get a sense for their experience and to improve on, on the following year? Uh, not uh, for uh, specific to the president um, attending commencement. We do look for feedback in the secretary's office here at the university. Uh, does uh, do a formal feedback gathering on commencement in general so that we could tweak the plan and we have over a number of years. And all university commencement like this is fairly new to us. It's only probably been the last, um, I think, about 10 years that we do that. It, it normally was done at the uh, school and college level. So this is fairly new where we have all in in one place. So that feedback does go on over the course of okay. uh, after commencement, but not specific to having um, the president here. Right. Okay. Great. Thanks, Tony. Um, well, well that, I mean, that wraps up the content of today's session. Uh, that we don't look like we have any questions just yet, um, but if you have any additional questions, please feel free to continue submitting those now. Um, while we wait for more questions to trickle in, uh, I'd just like to make sure that I encourage you all to visit the Sightlines website. Um, following today's event uh, and our really our insights page, if you'd like to stay current with with the you know, relevant industry trends, you know really any of the latest best practices or innovative silly solutions that we share, um, insights is, is your resource. And Jim, if you can go to the next slide just so we can kind of get a sense of what it looks like. Um, insights is your resource to easily access industry knowledge from both Spotlight and our member institutions in this way. Uh, there you'll find blog posts, articles. Webinar recordings, that's where this session will be located, uh, and more information on upcoming events. So you'll have the opportunity to also sign up for our monthly newsletter, things like that. Uh, so please be sure to check that out from time to time as we frequently update this page with new information, uh, similar to some of the, the, the stories and the, and the things you're hearing about today or you heard about today. Um, oh, looks like we just, we just got another question coming in. So it was mentioned the first visit from the White House staff is six days prior to the event. Did they provide you information in advance of that meeting so you knew how to plan for it? Uh, no. Uh, the only thing they provided us with uh, was um, who, or I should say specifically the agencies that would be attending. And um, over that weekend, I received uh, uh, there were a couple of emails back and forth uh, from the leads from those agencies. So the lead from the White House advance team uh, introducing himself, uh, the lead from the Secret Service introducing himself, and you know my reciprocating that. That was the only communication we had. Okay. I think that's by design, right, Tony? That's the way they do it. Period. Yeah, that's right. a that's kind that's of that's a lot. operating procedure for them, and I, I will tell you that. Um, they uh, do not, so this is a logistical nightmare for them as well, they, they do not typically insert the president into an event. What they do is build events around the president. And they never, except for campaigns and, of course, an occasional college or university commencement, never put the president in a 50, 60, 70,000 uh, person venue. So that typically only happens during campaign season. Yeah, and rarely then. I mean, this is, this is a unique yeah. event. Most most events that I've been to with, you know, president or presidential candidates, you know, ten thousand would be the max. This is just a huge, huge event for him to go to. And interestingly, um, and on that, that Sunday night before the event, we had uh, Bernie Sanders here as well, who uh, <laughs> uh, who asked to come and did. And uh, we were in the midst of all of this planning, and uh, you know, there was no way to say no, you cannot come. And so. Um, on that on that Sunday night before the Monday, he uh, he had an event here for about eight thousand people. Yeah. Well, great. Any more questions, Eric? No, it looks like the, it looks like we've addressed all questions uh, that have been submitted so far. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you all uh, for joining us today, and especially thank you to both Jim and Tony. You guys did a great job. This was a great story, and I'm sure people uh, really got a lot out of it. It was very interesting. Um, so I do hope that everyone did enjoy the session and, and found the information valuable as they continue to explore ways to, you know, really create new, you know, facilities conversations on campus. 
so please don't hesitate to contact us uh, via our website, sightlines.com, or directly at insights at sightlines.com. If you have any additional questions following today's call, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so thank you again, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care. Great. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Hey, Tony, thank you very much for uh, being willing to be an interviewee again, and uh, I think everybody really enjoyed it. It was my pleasure. Thank you.